It's my pleasure to introduce and welcome Anna O'Byrne, who is here with us from New York, where she's an associate professor at Stony Brook University. She received her doctorate in philosophy at Vanderbilt University under the supervision of Greg Horowitz after writing a master's thesis with Richard Rorty at the University of Virginia. Her Professor O'Byrne specializes in 20th century and contemporary European philosophy, and her work focuses on the intersection of ontology and politics, particularly questions concerning embodiment, gender, labor, and pedagogy. Her recent publications include Natality and Finitude, in which she builds on the work of Heidegger, Diltai, Hannah Arendt, and Jean-Luc Nessy, arguing for a rethinking of finitude in terms of natality or birth. And also Umbilicus, Toward a Hermeneutics of General Difference. It's her contribution in the forthcoming book, Carnal Hermeneutics. And her current project is titled Genocide and Generation, and her talk today is entitled Genocide and the Logic of Society. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you all for, uh, for being here, and especially for all the work that went into organizing this. I, uh, I haven't been able to cut my paper as much as I ought to, but I cut the title. So now the title is this. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Not at all. I didn't even tell you that this was happening. And let me begin with a little ethnic brown. The philosophical problem of genocide, if there is one, is not then that it occurs, but rather that we can make no ultimately justifiable argument for why it should not occur. What does continental philosophy have that can help us to think about genocide? This epigraph is taken from a succinct essay by Martin Schuster. The essay is called Philosophy and Genocide, and it appears in the Oxford Handbook of Genocide Studies. It comes at the end of a discussion of Horkheimer and Adorno's Dialectic of Enlightenment, a work that famously puts into question all attempts at ultimate philosophical justification. As Schuster writes, any ultimate philosophical ground or justification becomes suspect in light of their claims, that is, Horkheimer and Adorno's claims about reason via the elaboration of their dialectic. Right away, then, we are at the limit. Which, particularly when it comes to ethics, it seems to be where continental philosophers like to hang out. Other sorts of philosophers might, at this point, excuse me, Other sorts of philosophers might, at this point, uh, begin to work through the details of how to think through this by developing thought experiments uh, about trolleys and hot air balloons, or constructing examples about soldiers and hand grenades, by redefining and redefining the hedonic calculus, by sorting out the terms of the abortion debate, for instance, or working out strategies for making uh, policy decisions, or working out the difference between transcendental universality and empirical, uh, ethical experience. But the Continentals are against the existential wall, as it were, on the threshold, at the edge, always peering into the abyss. But they're not alone there. Richard Schuster goes on to cite Richard Rorty, or Martin Schuster goes on to cite Richard Rorty. Quote Rorty now, all vocabularies even those which contain the words which we take most seriously, the ones most essential to our self-descriptions, are human creations. This would mean giving up the idea that liberalism could be justified and Nazi or Marxist enemies of liberalism refuted by driving the latter up against an argumentative wall, forcing them to admit that liberal freedom has a moral privilege which their own values lacked. Any attempt to drive one's opponents up against a wall in this way fails when the wall against which he is driven comes to be seen as one more vocabulary, one more way of describing things. And that's from Rorty's Contingency, Irony, and Solidarity. There is no mention here of the abyss, but the insight is the same. All philosophical arguments we might produce against genocide, even against genocide, will lack an unassailable foundation. And yet, uh, there is the fact of genocide. If philosophy is going to say anything about the world, shouldn't it be saying something about this? <coughs> or, if we want to scrub that sentence of its normativity, if philosophy can say anything about the world, 
I can't say something about this. Perhaps I can figure out, indeed, what this is. And that's what the first part of my paper will consist of. Some attempts to think through philosophically, which might be pragmatically or analytically or continentally, I'm not sure, uh, figure out what genocide is. And in the second part, I will think more about groups, specifically religious groups. Can religion mark a group as susceptible to genocidal violence? If religion is a choice, is it the relevant, is it the relevant sort of marker for such groups? If it's not a choice, what happens then when a person changes religion? What's the meaning of religious conversion for the constitution of a religious group? And here, a recent article by Joshua Anderson that brings together Jacques Derrida and also two Islam Islamic thinkers, Abdullah Al-Nayim and Abdul Karim Sarouj, provides food for thought. If secular democracy is autoimmune, using Derrida's term, can we likewise see a sort of autoimmunity in religious sects at work in the phenomenon of religious conversion? Could this help disturb then how we think about genus in genocide and how we think about genus at all? So the first part, genocide. And this will consist of uh, four attempts to think about what this word means, particularly when we break it in two, when we try to think about the genus on the one hand and the side on the other. But let me begin with, it, begin with a little anecdote that comes from the author, a, a Dutch author, Alfred van Cleef. And he wrote a book called The, uh, the Lost World of the Berberovich Family, which was an account of the breakup of Yugoslavia from the point of view of one particular Bosnian family. When the war was just two valleys over, they still didn't worry. And when it was in the next valley, uh, they still didn't worry. But even so, no one could imagine uh, it actually intruding on their quiet lives. But one day, a car suddenly careered into the, the village's central square, seeming to single out a particular house and cornering its occupant, whereupon the leader of the militiamen calmly leveled a gun at the young man and blew him away. The militiamen hustled back into their car and sped off. Van Cleef writes, they left behind them a village almost evenly divided. Those under 50 years of age had been horrified by the seemingly randomness of this act, while those over 50 realized, with perhaps even greater horror, that the young man who'd just been killed was the son of a man who, back during the partisan struggles of the Second World War, happened to have killed the uncle of the kid who had done the killing. And the older villagers immediately realized, with absolute clarity, that if this was possible, now everything was going to be possible. Close quote from Van Cleef. So first, first pass at genocide. Studies of genocide come in two parts. On the one hand, there's the study of the genome element, thinking about the question of genus. What makes a group a group? What sorts of groups are susceptible to genocide? Groups we're born into, that is, uh, groups formed by generation, certainly, races, uh, families, dynasties, tribes. But then what about ethnic groups and religious groups? Uh, could there be a genocide of Parsis, of uh, Unitarians? Is anyone born a Unitarian? Political groups, communists, Tea Partiers? Could there be a genocide of gay people, of political theorists, of inhabitants of Sarajevo, of inhabitants of Chestnut Hill? I find these questions fascinating because of the questions they in turn generate about identity and because of how they draw us into the question of who we are and who we go about deciding who we are. But then on the other hand, there is the, uh, the study of the side element of the word genocide, which involves thinking about the murderous practices of genocide. The questions are interesting here too. But the material that you end up having to think about is just miserable. Uh, details of the worst things that human beings can do to one another. And fascination there seems to get us off on the wrong foot. We seem to be back with the story of Leontius from the Republic, trying not to look, but looking at the horror of it anyway. But thinking about the side part of genocide, the killing of a genus, brings us then to questions of scale. 
If some genocides have millions of victims, the Holocaust, uh, Native Americans, and others have hundreds of thousands, I think of what happened in Rwanda, can we only use the term when the numbers are indeed huge, or when the proportion of the targeted population that's murdered is itself large? Independently, then, it brings up the question of method. What form does genocidal violence take? If the Nazis had persisted with piecemeal massacres in Eastern Europe, if they'd not come up with a system of concentration and annihilation camps that reached its apogee in Auschwitz, would it have been the same phenomenon? If Native Americans had died on account of germs alone and not also on account of guns, would we regard that phenomenon differently? So two, uh, another approach to the same distinction. The UN Declaration on Genocide, which was put together in 1948, states that genocide involves an attack on a group as such. So what is targeted here is the group as a group. Approaching this from the side of genus means asking what it is that makes a group a group at all. Again, a fascinating question. It's a matter of identity in the sense that I have a set of discernible characters. Or is it a matter of identity in the sense that I have a set of discernible characteristics that match up with the characteristics that you or you happen to have? And that those together make us a group? Or is it, or is that only the start of things? Indeed, just one of the many possible starts. And instead, what constitutes a group is the fact that the members share an experienced bond that I experience myself as belonging with you, in some sense. If we revert to generated genus as our model, there are often bonds of the sort that are built between parents and children, between generations of families that share characteristics, but more significantly, I think, share language. The new members come to be in the context of a language, the language of those who came before. Now, approaching this from the side of murder produces two results. First, it means emphasizing the fact in gen that in genocidal attacks, the members of the group are attacked just because they are members of the target group. They become targets because of their shared characteristic or their birth, not because of anything that they have done. In Hannah Arendt's terms, who they are is completely ignored in favor of the question of, or some idea of what they are. Secondly, it requires us to ask, what is it that dies in genocide? If the act uh, of genocide attacks the group as such, perhaps genocide can also be a matter of killing a group without necessarily killing the people. Could genocide be, as Claudia Card argues, a matter of social death? The prime example here, of course, is enslavement of Africans in America. If a group is subject to conditions where the bonds between parents and children are systematically broken, if new members of the group are born into conditions of natal alienation, if groups who arrive in this country sharing a common language and a common culture, but are then systematically broken up, sent to their different ways, is, is this not an attack on the group as such, and therefore genocide? After all, the UN resolution explicitly mentions the prevention of births as a group, of the prevention of births in a group, and the transfer of children as among genocidal acts. <coughs> Let me take a third look then at this distinction. The UN declaration also mentions that genocidal acts are intended to destroy the group. That means that we have to think about the intention of the perpetrators and even try to imagine what goes on in their minds. And this surely brings on another version of that attraction, repulsion, the Leontius effect. Do we really want to be those tourists prowling around Berlin, wanting to know where Hitler finally committed suicide? At the same time, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't that sort of fetish that led Adorno to suggest in a radio address in 1967 a radio address called Education After Auschwitz, led Adorno to suggest that all those Nazis who were serving time in German prisons at that point should submit themselves to psychoanalysis. 
he was offering this in the spirit of, well, it's the least they could do. It's the least they could do for the whistle shaft at that particular moment. But here we are in the absence of that psychological data. So approaching tense intention from the genocide means looking at how the victim group is designated, identified, interpolated. We have the propaganda films like Lenny Riefenstahl's or more specifically The Eternal Jew. We have the radio broadcasts from Belgrade and from Kigali. The descriptions, depictions, impersonations of Africans in America. However hidden internal motivations are, the mass mobilization of perpetrators, which is essential to genocide, requires mass media to do the work of distinguishing them from us and the work of demonizing and dehumanizing them. Intention in this way becomes public, becomes a public phenomenon. <clears throat> On the side of murder, then, the very use of the term murder already implies intent. Genocides don't happen accidentally. Annihilation requires a great deal of planning, not least because it invariably requires very many perpetrators who must be induced to act in a way that spreads culpability as widely as possible. Intention nevertheless remains troublesome. Did the young man who left from the car in that Bosnian village intend to rid the world of those people he identified as other? We're not told, by the way, which ethnic group he belonged to or which ethnic group the victim belonged to, and it in fact doesn't matter at all. Or did he intend to avenge his uncle's death? How many Rwandan villagers who wielded machetes that year intended the annihilation of all Tutsis? How many camp guards intended the destruction of all Jews? Let me make a, for, a fourth and last temp, attempt at this notion of genus and sign. How do members of groups experience their membership of those groups? How do I experience myself as being a woman, for instance, as distinct from or as part of being Irish? If I want to make a point, I might even declare myself to be an American. I have a certificate to show it. <laughs> and to make other points, in other contexts, I might identify you know, as a feminist or a Catholic or a New Yorker or an immigrant. I might get ironic about it. I might want to play with it in various situations. I might enjoy the paradoxes. I might want to make an activist point using them. In an expression of solidarity with a death row inmate, I could, or at least I could at one point, get myself a t-shirt saying, I am Troy Davis. And Troy Davis has since been executed by the state of Georgia. This is all fine. That ironic play is all well and good until the knock comes on the door. Until we're forced to respond to the statement, OK, you filthy, fill in the blank, get out of here, step outside. We have uh, something to say to you. Irony is gone in this situation. It's not a situation that risks violence or the, a situation where violence may erupt at any moment. <clears throat> Rather, the circumstances have become saturated with violence, such that the interpolation leaves you with nothing to say. There, there is nothing you can say at that particular moment. Oh, uh, I don't really, you know, you feel the Catholic, well, no, I don't really go to mass anymore or you, you filthy Kazakh, well, no, they're in the other apartment down the way, or, or you filthy Jew, well, uh, no, that was my grandparents, we're not that Jewish anymore. None of those things you could possibly say uh, have any import uh, in that situation, a, a situation so saturated with violence. Now, this is something that gets a very uh, amply thought through in Richard Bernstein's book, Violence, Thinking Without Bannisters. Now, I've already mentioned Rorty, and now here I am mentioning another distinctively American philosopher with roots in the pragmatic tradition. And we're supposed to be talking about continental philosophy here. It's worth remembering, and Annika has already made this point, it's worth remembering that continental philosophy is itself a distinctly American invention. And that a lot of interesting thing happens when it, continental philosophy, comes into conversation with other American traditions. And I mean, I take that plural uh, very seriously, American traditions of thinking. The insight that I want to draw from Dick Bernstein's book 
is that the reign of violence coincides with the evacuation of public space. Quote, when there is no effective public, the space is left open for a violent decision. Here it is. Close quote. That is to say, and this opens onto a much larger conversation, of course, the question of genocide is not a moral problem, but a distinctively political one. Can the phenomenon, or more correctly, the phantom of genocide, then perform a positive function for us in sustaining public space? Is it a phenomenon relevant, if only as a regulative negative example? I don't think that term works, but I think you know what I mean to the back and forth of a political life lived in a Western, Northern, liberal democracy, far from the extremes. And this is a question that Annika also brought up. What is the purpose, uh, the ten what is the purpose of that tendency in continental philosophy to run to the extremes? It's tempting to think that it is an extreme and an extremely rare phenomenon, and that such attempts suffer these sorts of problems that Agamben's ethical theory suffers when he seeks to base it on the Muslim, uh, which Jeffrey talked about this morning. Yet, how far are we really from genocidal extremes? Quite recently, in, uh, in the New York Review of Books, Charles Simic reviewed Ian Baroni's book, Year Zero, A History of 1945. And this is a quote from the review. How is it possible, I ask myself, that out of all the winners and losers in 1945, the United States is the only country in all the years since that has not experienced lasting peace, but has grown more and more enamored of military solutions to world problems, and has, has of late come to believe, at least in some high places, that it may have to fight a global war that will go on for decades, if not forever. Close quote from Simic. The phantom for Bernstein is not of genocide, not even of total war, but of the extreme of eternal war that already includes what must be experienced by the inmates of Guantanamo as eternal incarceration without trial and the use of torture. Towards the end of violence, Dick Bernstein writes, <coughs> those privileged moments of political freedom that can still serve as a standard and criterion for judging politics. This suggests then a role on the other side for those moments when we reach the opposite condition, when politics is foreclosed and interaction <coughs> or arguments proceed only by violent action. They must stand as privileged challenge. Bernstein elaborates this with reference to Iron's thought of revolutionary politics and that glorious, exciting moment of non-violent action when we're pulled out of private existence into public life. and find ourselves making decisions as member of our neighborhood, or workplace, or student councils. Identity be damned, demonstrating to our fellow citizens who we are, actualizing ourselves in the highest possible manner. Quote from Bernstein, I do not think it's possible, possible to predict when and where there will be an emergence and growth of this type of power. What events will catalyze such a movement? But when we carefully examine those non-violent movements that have been successful, we discover that there have always been those helping to prepare for it." Quote. My fear, but also in a way my hope, is that the same could be said of the upsurges of the opposite sort of power, the violence that shuts down the public sphere, forecloses debate and discussion, and expresses itself in genocidal violence. It's a fear because if there are those preparing it, their success is to be feared. It's a hope. Also, the careful examination can yield the results, it can yield the details we need to know of how it has come to pass that a public became susceptible to being overrun by violence. In Bernstein's view, at least, the question of the genus and whether or not it is susceptible to being eliminated as a group gives way then to the question of murder and the elimination of the public sphere. But now for the second part of what I want to say today. And this is about the question of conversion and the proposal that conversion is the autoimmunity of religion. So nevertheless, 
the interest in the genus is not eliminated uh, by the concern, concern specifically for the health and survival of our public spaces. I don't think the two questions can be so neatly set apart. Leo Bersani writes of the, quote, sacrosanct value of selfhood, a value that may account for human beings' extraordinary willingness to kill in order to protect the seriousness of their statements. Close quote. We don't encounter selfhood as such. We experience ourselves with others, and selfhood appears in the world as national selfhood or religious selfhood. And again, Annika gave us some ways of thinking about how uh, selfhood appears in the world as a shared moral selfhood. The statements that we will protect violently are statements that establish our belonging to nations or sects or groups of one sort or another. It didn't take ISIS to show us that religious statements rank among those for which we will kill and that religious groups are susceptible to violent attack. But it's still worth asking whether genocide is the right term to apply to these various uh, upsurges of violence. So definitions of genocide, uh, as I've been working through <coughs> here, uh, including the UN Declaration, are explicit in listing religious groups as among the sorts of groups that are susceptible uh, to genocide. But if we play the fill in the blank game again here, uh, with various denominations or various expressions of religious life, uh, we end up with things that sometimes make sense, sometimes not, and sometimes leave us puzzled. A genocide of Jews? Well, yeah, of course. A genocide of Baha'i? Uh, yeah. Genocide of Catholics? Uh, maybe not. Maybe not automatically. A genocide of Irish Catholics? Yeah. Uh, a genocide of Mormons? Maybe. Uh, a genocide of Unitarians? Maybe not. A genocide of members of the Society for Ethical Culture? Maybe not. Uh, a genocide of Branch Davidians? No. I don't think. Uh, of People's Temple members, one of the followers of Jim Jones? Uh, no, I don't think so. Again, it's hard to discern what it is that informs uh, our intuitions in response to these various examples. One way to think it through involves making a distinction between what we choose and what is given to us. In this case, if my religion is hooked to a racial or an ethnic identifier, it's regarded as relevant to the application of the term genocide. That resolves the quandary. That is to say, it is understood to have a part to play in the designation of a genus. Otherwise, <coughs> if it is not Uh, that is to say, it's understood as uh, to have a part to play in the designation of a genus. Otherwise, if it is something chosen, it does not. Hence, the members of the People's Temple didn't constitute a genus. But how coherent is the thought of religion, uh, is the thought that religion is something chosen? I might be Catholic for many different reasons, for example. If I am because I have a deep-seated conviction that the will of God is best expressed in the church, uh, how does that differ from the way of being a Catholic that occurs because I happen to be born into a Catholic family or because I married a Catholic? Could anyone tell the difference? Could anybody read off the difference from the outside, as it were? And indeed, could I tell the difference? Religion often, in fact, draws the line between communities. This is a matter of empirical fact. The line along which violence rages. Yet what if religion were also the very thing that would blur those lines? What if religion, specifically religious experience, destabilizes identities? What if the phenomenon of conversion in particular could be understood as demonstrating religion's being against itself? That is to say, borrowing Derrida's term, what if conversion reveals the autoimmunity of religion? Let me say a little bit about uh, conversion, thinking of a particular example. In the state of Gujarat, in India, uh, the Hindu party Vishwa Hindu Parishad 
has an ongoing campaign against conversion to Christianity. So this is analyzed by Gauri Vishwanathan, who wrote uh, a wonderful book, The Outside the Fold, Conversion, Modernity, and Belief. And the, the fact of this campaign shows an acute appreciation of the external elements of conversion, the historical and political context in which miss missionary efforts undertaken under imperialism are seen to have their offspring in contemporary attempts at proselytizing. The DHP party does not see itself as trying to legislate conscience. This is not an internal matter, but rather protecting a distinctive Indian heritage. Religion is not a matter of purely inner transformation, but of community cohesion and national identity. Gandhi, indeed, saw conversion as a tool of colonialism. The VHP, on the other side of the same coin, sees it as a threat to its vision of an essentially Hindu India. Before Thurman asks us to consider, isn't conversion violent at every turn and at every level? As an internal transformation, it tears us away from our own certainties and commitments. We die to our former selves. As the experience of the divine it blinds us, it undoes us, it throws us to the ground. Think of all those depictions of St. Paul. But opponents of conversion in India also argue that it's a more insidious mental violence whose victims are invariably poor and illiterate. Poverty makes us vulnerable, the argument goes since poor, pe poor people don't know any better and succumb to the promise that with conversion will come a better life. And we see a version of the same argument raging in South America. What Vishwathan argues against, or warns against in addition, is the temptation, though, to refuse agency to the poor simply because they are poor. We can apply the term violence at least to the destabilizing effects of conversion. Massimo, Massimo Leone working out a semiotic analysis of conversion narratives, mainly drawn from the early modern period, identifies three moments in the experience of conversion. First, the destabilization of the subject, then the crisis, and then the restabilization of that subject. Vishwanathan identifies a similar movement within the convert's community. A conversion demonstrates that an element of identity that had been considered utterly salient and also deeply embedded, even essential, is in fact mutable and apparently at will. If this element, then why not others? Why not all others? If we can change one part of who we are, what does it mean for every attempt that we make to identify ourselves? A shudder runs through the community, and suddenly, in this moment of crisis, everything is open to question. It's not so much that we all turn out to be hybrids, or all our religious practices and beliefs turn out to be syncretic, but rather that boundaries are blurred, porous, and, here comes the payoff, surely not worth fighting over. Except that this is not what happens. What Leon calls re-stabilization closes that moment of crisis, closes that conversion moment, and the boundaries are firmer than ever, and more hotly contested than ever, because now they are under threat. Yet, conversion at least preserves this destabilizing, potentially liberating possibility. Vishwanathan writes, violence is inherent in the historical moment in which the conversion occurs. Conversion <coughs> itself is only violent when the shift that happens to a new worldview turns into a desire to make that worldview prevail prevail above or over all others. The discontinuity introduced by the fact of a conversion disrupts claims to truth by setting the claim to truth of one religion in relation to those of another. This is not relativism or indeed a paternalistic secularism. It is sustainable uh, apparently from a religious pr perspective. David Krieger writes, quote, if unlimited communication the universality of knowledge and a more than merely local validity of norms are still possible, they can no longer be grounded in one unified systematic worldview or religion, which in the present global situation could only mean absolutizing one perspective among others, but rather in the ability to move between worldviews, 
The process of transition between worlds emerges in postmodernity as the only credible form of universalism. Close quote. But then what does this look like? Vishwanathan moves towards this point in a more modest uh, way, using more concrete terms and taking a Habermasian tone. Quote, if pluralism is not to be reduced to a slogan of live and let live, but imagined as a groundwork of community, communication between disparate groups on lines other than the assertion of their separate religious identities is the first step towards that goal. Merely encoding freedom of religion in the law is not enough. She continues, quote, the constitutional protection of the right to propagate religions does nothing to establish the new conditions for communication or promote the proactive exercise of tolerance, even through civil pluralism, even though civil pluralism forces communities to rethink their relations with each other <coughs> on principles other than that of religious difference. Close quote. Thus, Richard, Richard Kearney, uh, in his 1997 book, Post-Nationalist Ireland, was looking forward even then, in even more concrete terms, to new modes of being Northern Irish in a regionalized Europe, where people who earlier stood on either side of the sectarian divide, Protestant and Catholic, Protestant and Royalist, Catholic nationalist, they could find themselves, rather than uh, pitting their energies against one another, beginning to work together as farmers, for instance, as Northern Irish farmers trying to influence European agricultural policy, or as Belfast parents uh, campaigning for a children's hospital. Yet, if we're talking about farming and healthcare, we're no longer talking about the truth of revealed religion. We've left religion at home in the spirit of liberal or pragmatic Bortian irony, perhaps. However, a writer like Krieger, who I've just quoted, wants more than that. He remains committed to a, the destabilizing power of conversion, but like Vishwanathan, wants to set aside what he calls the apologetic exclusivism that comes on the heel of confessional conversion. He develops a thought of truth as conversion, a way of life he describes as cosmotheantric solidarity. That is, a way of being that overcomes the one-sided, uh, overcomes any sort of one-sided cosmocentrism, theocentrism, or indeed anthropocentrism. We mustn't isolate our discourse from the sacred any more than we isolate it from the natural. Quote, the ability to stand for truth as one sees it, in the realm of experience and action, in such a way, however, that one's own view is always open to correction, and thus to place one's own existence at stake, <coughs> is possible only as nonviolent praxis. Close quote. Now, I don't think this is right, or at least we need an awful lot more argumentation before we can convince ourselves that that is right. But what it does do is it delivers us to the aporia. And this is where Derrida can help carry our thinking further. So a few short words on autoimmunity. Francois made reference to it already yesterday. And it's something that emerges late in uh, Derrida's writing and becomes uh, spelled out most concretely in terms of democracy in Rose. And there, the notion is that uh, democracy is something that, under certain circumstances, will uh, suspend some of its core values in order to protect itself, in order to ensure its own survival. And the example that gets used is uh, the democratically elected government of uh, Algeria, when it sees the <coughs> result of an election promising to be uh, the election of an, is an anti-democratic Islamist group, it suspends the election. So it stops uh, a, an essential process of democracy in order to preserve democracy. Can we use the same way of thinking in order to understand what happens in religion? So Joshua Anderson writes uh, that Abdullah al Naim, uh, who's a Sudanese thinker, and Abdul Karim Sarouche from Iran, they share with Derrida the thought that the religious is necessarily profaned in its manifestation and propagation. And that leads them to defend broadly democratic values and freedom of religion from an Islamic perspective. 
So the distinction at work there is that the divine uh, is itself uh, inaccessible to us in its unscathed uh, nature. And that as soon as we, as it is manifest in the world at all, it is already uh, part of our human existence and is already scathed in that very manifestation. In Anderson's assessment, neither thinker, neither uh, Islamic thinker, carries through this thought to the, to the point where it would engage the autoimmunity that he believes characterizes all manifestations of the divine. That is to say, all sacred books, all priestly authority, indeed all mystical revelation. I would add that this would mean encountering the specific autoimmunity of specific manifestations of religion. So it's not about religion versus secularism, but it's a situation where religions are run up against others, that there's a competition between, uh, between sects. Derrida's discussion of religion happens in terms of the distinction and similarity between religion on the one hand and secularism on the other. While he sometimes makes an argument in the context of Islam or Christianity in particular, his concern is with the structure and persistence of religion as such, rather than what is particular to any given one. But if religious commitment, like our commitment to secular democracy, is undecidable, if it is subject to the double bind that he lays out in the essay of Faith and Knowledge, if the results of an act of religion are unpredictable, if such acts have the structure of chance and threat, then any given sect or denomination is subject to the same structure and condition. And the form its autoimmunity takes is the specific threat or promise of conversion. This is the core democratic value in freedom of religion. Encounters not just with secularism, but with other religions court the possibility of correction, faithlessness, apostasy, conversion. It courts instability and reminds us of the undecidability of our positions. Returning then to the very beginning, uh, in order to bring this to an end, what does continental philosophy have to offer us that will help us talk about genocide? It does help us look to the concrete, and this is something that uh, Jeffrey already made explicit this morning. It also urges us towards the extremes, and I think we have a lot of work to do to figure out what the value and purpose of that is. <coughs> It does take instability and undecidability very seriously. Uh, it resists the temptation to cover over aphorias. It attends to and turns our attention to contingency. Uh, this is the, uh, the thing that constantly draws me back to thought of natality, the utter contingency of our coming to being. And, and I hope we'll have time to discuss this one uh, in particular later. It makes us think about the distinction between ethics and politics. So I think once we uh, turn ourselves to genocide and begin to ask ourselves difficult questions about how we can produce an argument against it, at a certain point it becomes apparent that if our, our actions are always open to this structure of autoimmunity or undecidability, that then our commitments become essentially strategic. At that point it's hard to discuss them in terms of ethics and instead we're in a realm of contestation and a conversation which looks a lot more like what we would call the, the political realm. And this, finally, is what Derrida calls us to, uh, in my interpretation, when he speaks of the test and the ordeal of the undecidable. Thank you. So we have like 20, 25 minutes for questions. Thank you, Anne, for a really interesting and very clear talk. Um, my question is, um, picking up on your opening and final point about how can continental philosophy help us provide arguments against genocide? Yeah. Because I see kind of two ways of reading that. One is how can we find good arguments against the practice and existence and perpetuation and recurrence of genocide, but also against the very notion of genocide, i.e. that if you analyze it in terms of aphorias and undecidabilities, 
you can actually reach a point where there's no such thing as genocide. Yeah. And that might lead to, you know, the Hamlet situation of Craven's scruple thinking too precisely on the event that loses the name of action. So we say, <clears throat> as some people accuse you know, deconstruction, uh, of sort of leading us into inaction and paralysis because we've thought so much about it that actually there's nothing to be done. So I'd like to take an example, <clears throat> which you kind of touched on at least at one point when you're going through your list of what constitutes a genus or a genome. And you mentioned religion and then you mentioned different races. And you mentioned Catholic and then Irish Catholic, and you said yes. Right. You're going through yeses and noes, so it's, it's definite, but supposing. So just to grab onto that one, which yeah. is very Hibernian, and not to get too uh, Cork and <laughs> Watford about this, but um, take the Irish family. There's a big controversy about the Irish family. Is it a genocide? Is it not a genocide? Yeah. You get the nationalist debate saying it is, then you get the revisionists saying it's not, and so on. So, very briefly, to, to divide it into genome and side, right. at the level of genome, who, who, not what, what, what lives simple? The race, wicked, the Irish will kill. But if you go from the what to the who, following the parental or good, any good continental philosopher who might ask that question, any philosopher for that matter, to the subject of the who, you could push it to a point where you say, well, there's actually really no real who, because the Irish are what? They're Catholic, Protestant, and dissenter. They're not just all Catholics, because Protestants and dissenters died too. Uh, and, okay, so are they gay or planter? But you take Gale, the true Irish, so to speak, and you say, well, are they Anglo-Norman, and are they Viking, and you know, the Celts and the pre-Celts. So it's a mix, mm -hmm. as we know. In fact, the genetic, ethnic composition of those inhabiting Britain and those inhabiting their environment is the same. So you could analyze it to such a point that there is kind of no genome left, right? And then you might ask mm -hmm. on the other side, well, the side, and as you put it, the intention of the author. Well, what was the intention? of the author in the family. Who was the author? Was it Queen Victoria? Right? What did she know? She gives £100 to the Irish to stop them starving. And then nobody could give any more money than that because it would be rude to give more than Queen of England. Uh, so she didn't help much, but how much did she sanction the, the ongoing uh, genocide or, or liquidation of, of the population? They fall from 9 to 3 million in about over 10 years. 10 years. Not all through death, but through immigration. Was it Lord Trevelyan with his economic theories? This is all part of the kind of hidden hand of God, and we've got to let uh, the economy take its way. There's lots of food in Ireland, but it has to go to the colonies and to those who can afford to pay it. If you were against that, then you're against the natural law of God and the law of nature. Or was it the royal viceroy in Dublin with his regiments and policemen and, and what? So who, who, right? Once you go from the what to the who, who, who really intended this? Did anybody intend it? Or was it the potato? Right. You know, as Joyce apostrophized the potato in, in, in Ulysses, you know, oh, oh potato, bringer of plague and pestilence, pray for us. Was it the potato who did it? Oh. So who is the potato? <laughs> right. So you can take the who is the Irish, and then you can take the who is, who is the perpetrator who did it. And you could end up by analyzing it to such a degree that you might say, well, in fact, there's no genocide at all. There's neither a genome nor a side. Right. And what do we do with that? Then? Do we say, well, let's be more subtle, as we should always be as philosophers in, in analyzing these things, but do, might it not run the risk at times of so problematizing the issue into a Piraeus mm -hmm. that it can become a kind of revisionism or even an apologetics? It's really nobody's fault, because there's no who anyway. I love it. I see this this question as being the other side of uh, of the coin uh, that uh, that Francois was drawing your attention to yesterday in terms of uh, what responsibility means in conditions of infinite responsibility. So one response would be to say that, uh, it, as Derrida says so very often, that once we begin to uh, to appreciate the apparatic structure of our decision uh, decisions, once we uh, begin to once we're forced to realize uh, again, as if you were picking up a thread from the Dorna Horkheimer, the ultimate uh, ungroundability of our uh, of our stances. Uh, this does not, by any means, uh, release us from the need to take a stance. 
that on the contrary, we have to face up to the fact that those stances are taken on the basis of something that we're never going to be able to articulate in all its subtlety. Uh, but nevertheless, we're forced to take it. On the other hand, then, what is uh, what's philosophizing in this mode doing for us? Well, what is thinking uh, through notions of genus uh, in these ways doing for us? Why uh, doesn't uh, ethical decision happen on the basis of something like affect or on the basis of some, uh, some better notion of empathy that we were talking about uh, this morning? It strikes me that, uh, that this is a, um, this, this sort of uh, dismantling uh, is something that holds the possibility of, of yielding new ways of thinking. I'd like to be able to, you know, we don't, we'd all like to be able to determine better uh, where they could lead us, but it always has to happen in, in the specificity of it. So in, in specificity of a moral, or what I want to call a, a distinctive political situation, um, but also uh, in the deployment of certain sorts of philosophical tools. It strikes me as having something to offer in terms of, uh, of thinking better. This does, this does fall victim to the sorts of uh, criticisms that are often leveled against Arendt when she makes that great claim uh, in the aftermath of Eichmann, that uh, what we see here is a failure to think. If what we mean by thinking is a, uh, a, a making of ever more subtle distinctions, then that's certainly not adequate. But what, of course, what she had in mind, of course, was a sort of uh, very Kantian thinking about ends. But if we can uh, if we can apply ourselves as philosophers uh, to uh, to questions of ends in that Kantian sense, but also to a more phenomenologically oriented thinking through a situation, I have this hope, which may be utopian, uh, that it will get us better answers. Perfect. Thank you. Um, thanks again for uh, your talk, also. Um, you asked, you asked Annika a really hard question this morning. Let's hear you go to ask me. Okay, so my question um, is just about a, a, a remark you made. I'm not sure I got the exact wording, but it was something like that genocide is a problem uh, of or maybe in politics, not morals. And yeah. so uh, I want to ask you what you mean by that and why it, why you think that doesn't you know, involve a false dichotomy, because some people would be inclined to think that maybe it's just a problem of political morality, which is you know, a term that's used a lot. But I also wanted to toss into other uh, remarks. Uh, um, one, I'm wondering what's so continental here. I mean, this just sounded yeah. to me largely like conceptual analysis. You take genocide, you break it down into the sub-concepts, um, you know, deal with uh, codified definitions you know, from the UN, yeah. and then you worry those, you give, you cite actual examples we're about killing branch Davidians, or about killing uh, Irish Catholics, you come up, you, you consider more fanciful examples, what if somebody wanted to kill all the Unitarians, and so on, that, that seems to me the kind of stuff that's done in standard analytic philosophy, yeah. um, conceptual analysis, so I mean you do, you, know, you invoke Horkheimer and so on, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about the methodology, what's distinctively continental mm -hmm. um, uh, about that. So. Um, maybe the last question is an easier one uh, to answer. I said I... softballs. <laughs> <laughs> is it? I said, these are softball questions. Not Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it took care of things this morning. Um, yes, indeed. The, I am interested in those moments where I uh, continental philosophy, and again, I, I think we're in the process of thinking through what that is, and what is continental ethics. We're spending time <coughs> figuring that out here today. Uh, oh, the points where it strikes me as most interesting, uh, I observe in my own reading and thinking, are those points where it, uh, it runs into or falls into step with various strands of American philosophy, like those moments when uh, when we see uh, Rorty and irony, for instance, worked out in different ways. What, um, 
And so I, uh, I, you spotted it exactly right. I mean, I'm reading Cloudy Card and uh, drawing on all sorts of resources that are offered there in various traditions. What uh, the point where it delivers me to, mind you, is that um, is that moment identified by Horkheimer and Adorno, uh, that has to do with the uh, unfoundability of uh, of stances that we would take against genocide of all things. I mean, how could this be? How could we not be able to say, in ringing moral terms, uh, that this is wrong? And if we can't, uh, if we can't stand up and make a claim about that, then uh, then how are we going to have uh, anything like a, an ethics at all? And that's why I'm interested in shifting it into um, uh, into a public realm uh, that would then take seriously the fact that the this, the ground falls away at each turn. Like we're we're not going to be able to get uh, to a, a still point that we can use as the basis for our ethical theory. And take seriously, the way Anderson puts it, uh, that <clears throat> all of our claims are going to be strategic claims. And at that point, it seems, that we have moved away from moral theory, and we are in a, in a public space that is a political space, a distinctively political space, which is to say it's the space of contestation. The, uh, uh, the Distinction that I'm uh, that I'm working with there is the notion that if we uh, if we make a moral claim, it isn't open to the same sort of contestations that our political claims are. So we, when we make a moral claim, we we do seek that it should prevail. Uh, it it has that sort of standing for us. And when we issue a moral condemnation, we want it to carry uh, the um, you know the sanctions that come with something that has. Uh, that has the form of a, uh, a claim based on something transcendent. So it, it, it has this or the divine to it. Um, but if we, uh, if we acknowledge that that sort of fundament isn't available to us, then we have to think of our claims in strategic terms, which is why I want to call it political rather than moral. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking slightly along the same lines, uh, but I, I'm not sure if we have to be such on a dichotomic basis here. Just to separate politics from the ethics. Such dichotomic here. Uh, separate politics from the ethics and yeah. from the politics. Uh, now, considering what politics could be, could be driven up from continental tradition, well, Paul Ricoeur uh, thinks that if, if there are some shared structures, we mostly understand as institution, political institution. Uh, well, those structures are of indicative kind, of a certain ethos. So the strategic right. yeah. decisions that we made, made through those institutions, or institutionalized even, then those are indicative of a certain ethos that could then be turned into a particular ethics, if you like. So uh, I, I'm sure if you have to just make such a huge distinction between either or. Uh, but that wasn't my main point. Let me get back to the potato. Uh, okay. So when I was hearing your, particularly the first part of your paper, uh, I was thinking a potential genocide, if we want to de define it as such, that could be called the Ebola outbreak. Mm. Now, or, or maybe the fact of not trying to tackle the malaria. So, isn't that another kind of an example that could be classified as a silent genocide? Mm -hmm. uh, that we just simply, like in Rwanda, the international community, even the UN, it had admitted that there is something going on, but did they really pay attention to such measures that they would then prevent the things taking place? International community has acknowledged the malaria, the Ebola outbreak. Mm -hmm. Have we really done anything to prevent, really? anything to take place in more, or try to curb down those outbreaks. I don't think we have. Right. So getting back to the idea of potato, the natural phenomena here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then going even further, what, what about the genocide as from a non-anthropocentric point of view? Oh, yes. uh, 
It's the latest, I, I believe, it was a week or two weeks ago that we read news reports of the fact that uh, about 40% of all biodiversity has been cut back because of the environmental crisis that we face. So we are exterminating species. Right. We are literally focusing on certain, not intentionally so necessarily, but nevertheless that's what we are doing. It's another example of a silent genocide that could be going on, yes. but from a non anthropocentric point of view. So this kind of gets back to slightly what Richard was asking. Does this idea of a genocide work? And uh, if we still have to assume it somehow, as a working definition, or as a term through which we can then see and understand our world, to better be equipped to understand our inherent roles in the mm. things that are intertwined, not only in political, but also as well. <coughs> then what are the conclusions that should be drawn? Excellent. The, uh, the term is an uh, enormously contested term, of course. Uh, so in international politics, when, um, uh, when bad things begin to happen uh, that involve the killing of large numbers of people, uh, the, uh, the term, there's a, a distinct moment when the term genocide begins to be used. And then the, uh, the, uh, the question is, when can we get the, uh, the players uh, in international politics to take on this notion? And surely once we start using the term, then that produces certain, uh, certain intervention, uh, demands for certain sorts of intervention. So that's why it was crucial uh, at the moment when genocide started to be used as a way to describe what was happening in Darfur, for instance. Uh, so again, we're very much in the realm of politics there, because the, uh, and, and this is politics in, uh, you know, not the political, and not, nothing as abstract as that, but rather how are we going to persuade our political leaders to, uh, to send troops uh, to stop this? Uh, this violence happening, uh, to, to protect the victims there. Uh, so the, that's a, another set of, of distinctly political questions about the usage of the term and, uh, and how it is a constantly contested usage. And that feeds in uh, very particularly to exactly the sorts of circumstances you're talking about. If we're talking about types, a genus, or an, isn't a you know, species of beetle precisely the sort of genus uh, that fits into this terminology, and isn't it something that we should be concerned about our uh, participation in that? The thing that interests me most right now is uh, is the deployment of this term to identify, you know, the the biggest worst thing that we can think about when the, when this uh, when these sorts of events happen, uh, the. Uh, the word that gets deployed to, in an attempt to make sure that something happens about it is the term genocide. What are we doing when we say that? I mean, what, uh, what statement are we making about how it is that we constitute ourselves as uh, having access to political institutions that can act in response to that? Uh, how is it that we constitute ourselves as belonging to political institutions that are not responsible for that? Uh, I think that, that uh, that's perhaps the, the deepest uh, political but also philosophical question here. And what's at stake in our desire to, uh, to appeal to specifically that question? And our, the difficulty in, uh, in, its constant, in our decision uh, when a challenge like yours is made. Well, what about this? What about uh, biodiversity? What about things that we, um, uh, that we refuse to put this title to? One last question, Helen, as well. Just a uh, clarification. <laughs> no, you want to stop now? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, just two, two questions of clarification. Uh, you mentioned conditions here at the end. Yes. So I just wanted to hear more about this. You can just perhaps clarify what you have in mind and what, what's at stake in that term. Mm -hmm. And my second uh, question, also clarification, is you just mentioned the notion of failure of thought. And it reminded me of a passage in a, a text by Anna Aaron, uh, what is it, existential theory, an article. In an article, what is existential theory, 
-hmm. where she speaks about the failure of thought. She makes the claim that philosophical thought must heighten that failure. Because must heighten its own failure? Well, heighten the experience of the aporia that she's talking about, leading to the possibility of thought. So I don't know, it's in the paper, but you'll see eventually. Okay. Uh, when you read it. <laughs> but it's in there. But I, I just thought, uh, I was wondering if you use that expression in that sense or not. Uh, or, or not, or it's a different context. No, I certainly had Arendt in mind, not specifically that essay, but rather the, the claim she makes in Eichmann. <laughs> But um, okay. the they're, they're separated in time because the... the uh, That's different. Yes. It is, yeah, and the existential There's a philosophy. failure of thought which she considers to be the highest test and experience of the impossible. Yes. In, in that essay. Mm. I don't think it's the same sense as the lack of thought. No, I don't I think, think so. Okay. And I think, yeah... Okay, that's a good clarification. And it's uh, and that's a good reminder that I think that's even more interesting for what I'm trying to do. It's Maybe. Insofar yes. as we're putting philosophy uh, to the test here. Yes. And Just, you, you, know, you did mention the aporia of ethics, right? You mentioned the aporia of ethics. Yep, exactly. And Anna Arendt wants to dwell in that. Contingency is not unrelated to that, too, in right. the sense that the... Um, uh, the notion of uh, of contingency is bound up uh, with the notion of natality. The uh, the things uh, over which we have no control whatsoever, and that could very well have been different, uh, that preceded our coming into being. So the uh, impossibility of taking uh, our existence uh, as being in any way necessary. So it's that contrast between necessity and contingency. By the way, in that essay, just to remind her, that she says that thinking fails in thinking what it thinks. That's how she puts it. Thinking fails in thinking what it thinks. Yes. When thinking thinks something, it fails. In, in, it fails. That's what she calls. Which the, might be a description. That's the failure of thought. She calls it. Right. Which might be a description of what Richard was describing in his uh, uh, in his question. Go ahead, Professor. We're, we're about out of time. But. Okay, I just want to, uh, to make an observation. I, I'm not sure again exactly how you phrased it, but you seem to be approvingly citing quotation from Charles Simic, and it was something to the effect that the United States was the only one of the major World War II party, uh, uh, powers that has not had lasting peace since the war. It seems very strange. <laughs> A false claim. <laughs> 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 in Algeria, Russia sent troops into Hungary and Czechoslovakia and conducted right. many wars by clients, right? They got the Cubans to send you know, troops into Angola. You know, yeah. Shane died in Bolivia, China, yeah, Korea, yeah. North Korea. This is strange. It is a strange, wonderful rhetorical claim, I, I must say, that um, uh, it, uh, it's a shocking claim when you read it in, you know, in the comfort of your uh, your North American home mm -hmm. and the uh, the sense of security. 9/11 and all that, not notwithstanding the the sort of security in which we think of ourselves as living, uh, and how easy it is to neglect the fact that uh, uh, that there are still prisoners in Guantanamo, that the war on terror continues in the form of American troops posted overseas. It, no, I, I, I agree with you. Um, look at uh, Russia and the Ukraine right now. Uh, so what, um, uh, well, what, what Simic is doing is, I think, trying to draw our attention to the sort of complacency with which we can uh, think of ourselves as having endured, uh, enjoyed the relative peace of the Cold War and the flourishing of, of peace after that. Thank you. Thank you.